Hello, everybody. Come on in. Grab a seat. Make yourself at home, as you should when you're a guest in Bradley's house. I am the co-host, Jared Orr. She is the sister of my favorite musician. I'm the co-host of her favorite podcast. We're the dynamic duo that bring you guys Bradley's house. My partner, Miss Kelly Noel. Kelly, how are you? I'm doing fabulous. And I have to warn you, I just had a nitro cold brew and I am wired. I'm not going to lie. It's, I'm going to be going all night with this thing. All jacked Coffee. up on Mountain Dew. I like it. I like it. <laughs> Coffee right. I have is to, my vice. I had to do the same thing to get myself up and ready for this because, you know, it's a little later on this side of the country. But That's true. Oh, always excited to get another amazing episode of Bradley's House out for our listeners. I think people have really been starting to pick it up. I see the views are going up. The comments are going up. The shares are going out. We really appreciate that, guys. But Kelly, a lot of that is because you keep lining up these amazing guests for us each week. Who are we hanging out with this week in Bradley's house? I have been looking forward to this one for quite some time. I first talked with him a couple of years ago and was so impressed. And um, I'm a fan of his music. And that of uh, I'll just tell you, our guest today is an incredibly talented musician who's best known for playing in the 90s band Porno for Pyros. He's also done musical scores for films, and he has 23 years clean. We're honored to have Peter Stefano with us today. Peter, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much for the lovely intro. This is, is really a treat for me to have you on. I have so much respect for you for what you've done musically and what you've done with your recovery. And I just think it's a perfect fit for our show and for our audience. I think people are really going to enjoy hearing from you. So tell me, how did you first get into music? Well, I, um, my parents were from Sicily, Italy. So I'm a full-blooded Sicilian. And, and they came out during World War II wow. to Argentina and then from Argentina to Chicago, then from Chicago to Santa Ana, California, and then had me in Santa Monica. Oh, wow. And, and we're, uh, I was born and raised in Santa Monica. And my father used to play guitar and sing Italian songs and mm. original songs that he wrote. And he would do songs like, you know, Cella Luni, Mezzu Mari, Mamma Mia, Mi Mari, Italian, That's Sicilian so things. Great. And he'd throw parties. And everyone was so happy when he was singing and playing guitar. And, and he also, my father was like, uh, he got on the Lawrence Welk show and he did wow. the Rose Tattoo play at the Tennessee Williams thing. And he was the music uh -huh. for the live play. And he did that every weekend. And I participated in it. And so I just, I fell in love with, with uh, you know, the happiness of that. And then, then I saw, you know, Elvis Presley, one of the Elvis Presley movies where he's, you know, there's bullies in the yeah. party, uh, you know, picking on some girl or whatever. And he says, don't pick on the girl. And then the guy punches him. And then he beats up all him and all his friends, then grabs the guitar and sings <laughs> and then leaves with the hot girl. And I'm like, that's, like what, I do. Do for, that's what I want to do when I grow up. You know, I want to get in. And that's exactly and how I, it was, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah that's I, how it works. I, I want to beat up the bullies at the party. <laughs> sing and play and have the girl fall in love with me and then leave with her, you know? <laughs> Who doesn't? And so um, it was that simple. Then it got, I got deep into the actual music. I fell in love with the music. Mm. And then I started to, uh, you know, investigate my heroes and what they were doing. And so I started copying them and I ended up uh, a drug addict and an alcoholic. Yeah, that's, there's a lot of that in the music industry. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a tough tough business. When did you start using? Well, I um I used to pretend like I would watch, you know, Big Wednesday and I would see them all, you know, surfing these big waves and then dr drinking around a keg and dancing and having fun and and then I'd see cowboy shows where the cowboy would ride into town and then kick open the saloon. And order a drink and then, you know, take a shot of whiskey and then cold cock the guy next to him and then shoot <laughs> someone up at the stairs and they would break through the stairs. Then he would take the hooker upstairs and then, you know, and then bash out the window and jump on the horse to get away from the people trying to kill him. And, and, and that's just, how it really I, is, right? <laughs> I, mean, I didn't like other people get into like drinking and using for like, oh, well, I had, you know, a rough life and everything. I just wanted to, to copy these. I just, I was, so what I did is I went to my dad's liquor 
cabinet and I used to get um, ginger ale and I would shake it so all the bubbles would go away. And uh-huh. I put ginger ale in shot glasses and drink it and then punch my pillow and fight with my pillow and then take another pillow upstairs and pretend it was a girl, you know? So I was, I wanted to be an alcoholic, you know? And then, wow. um, and then I tried it. It was just so horrible and it burned. It was the gasoline, you know? And, mm. and so, and I was like, I, there's no way I can really do it. I'll just keep pretending, you know? So I kept pretending and, um, uh, and I would pretend drunk and pretend I was drunk. And then, you know, I saw bands like Aerosmith and, you know, on TV. And, and then I saw uh, uh, Peter Frampton play in this, a scene in, um, I think it was called Sergeant Peppers. Mm. And he was drinking this big glass of this, like, drink. And he drank it. And he started hallucinating. And there was all these girls massaging him and stuff. And he went into this orgy, you know, like. And I was like, oh, my God, I want to get out of my mind and have sex. You know, like <laughs> That's what I want. it was just so I was really just influenced, you know. And so like and a lot then of I, violence and sex in your um, <laughs> well, aspirations. I mean, well, it's just because there's bullies. You know, you're scared sure. of, of fighting. You know, there's people at school that are taller, you know, and they punch you in the face and you don't punch in the face yet. And you're, you know, just bullies. And, you know, it's, it's hard growing up to be a man. There was three things I was scared of, you know, getting beat up in front of girls having sex with girls like what's that like am i gonna you know is my penis gonna be big enough am am i gonna come in two seconds you know what i mean like being terrified you know sure and then legitimate um, concerns yeah just you know whatever and then communication having to deal with people so anyway i got into it just to 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 be you know uh to copy my heroes and then yeah when i actually you know took it uh, uh, and then i felt something the Mm. fear of sex went away the fear of bullies went away and i felt i could talk i felt i i felt like somebody i felt i wasn't insecure it it Mm -hmm. it it did something to me it it fixed me you know Mm. so then all the school dances i would get a little bottle of vodka and drink it and i'd have the courage to go up to girls and ask them to dance and i would not be afraid of bullies or people taller than me and so so i started to use it I did it first because of the movies and everything. It looked cool. And, and, and plus, I read about my musical heroes and, and listening to music and what Hendrix did and what John Coltrane did and what, mm. you know, Miles Davis, uh, just everybody, Keith Richards. Yeah. And so I just copied them and I dove into it so I could make music like them, you know. And so, and unfortunately, I have the alcoholic addiction gene and yeah. you know it it uh i couldn't control and enjoy my crack smoking you know um mm. i couldn't control and enjoy my drinking i couldn't control and enjoy my heroin like keith richards you know and so i i uh, you know everything fell apart you know friend i went through eight drug rehabs wow you know um mm. I've overdosed all over the world. So when people, you know, when people look at me and they go, congratulations, there's no congratulations. You know, I just kept getting found, mm. you know, Shannon who OD'd once and he was gone, you know, yeah. well, I just kept getting, like I would be in line waiting to get a falafel in, in, um, Florida and I just stopped breathing and drop, you know, oh my God. and someone would find me. The, one of the first times I overdosed, I was on the toilet taking a crap. And Whoa. I stopped breathing, you know, oh and a lifeguard came in and found me and revived me, you know. Whoa. And so I just kept getting found everywhere, you know. And so um, I believe that, you know, this sobriety thing is not something, oh, you, you know, you congratulations, you got, it's a gift. It's a gift. Yeah. And there's still stuff I have to do on this earth still. And mm. I, I think it's, it's my primary purpose is to let people know that that uh, the obsession of alcohol and drugs can be removed from a higher power. You know, I'm not going to say, you know, it's it's this kind of a thing or creative intelligence or God or, a, 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 you know, Christianity, Judaism. Well, I'm not going to say it's from a certain thing. I don't know where it's from, but it, but I do know that I've sponsored atheists and that's okay. Just the, the main thing you have to do is, is to believe that there's, there's electricity or some kind of a frequency that you tune into right. 
with one word and it's called honesty. It's the mm-hmm. most important thing. So if you're trying to tune into KLOS, you know, some radio station mm-hmm. and you're and it's 95.5, but you're at 95.6, you know, it's going to, you know, it's, it's yeah. not going to be totally in. So if I have my five senses and I slap somebody in the face, right? Mm-hmm. My five senses recorded it. I was in a restaurant. I was smelling the food. I felt her, her cheek or his cheek. Mm-hmm. I heard the sound. I saw it. I smelled it. All my senses recorded it. And then we go to court and I show up at court and I say, I wasn't there. I was in Alaska. You know, I don't know. I never saw this person. My brain, all my five senses recorded an experience that I've denied. And so you, you start shorting out. It's like Mm -hmm. telling a computer one plus one is three, you know? And so what happens is you start chain smoking, you start overeating, you start, it it all starts with dishonesty, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so when, when they say, you know, these religions and stuff, you know, you go to confession, um, that's why you get a sponsor. You find somebody that you can just let it hang be honest, you know, and then, then the Holy Spirit comes or the radio station, that frequency, the mojo, and it removes the obsession. Now about like who makes it and who overdoses and who survives and who doesn't, that's completely beyond my comprehension of why someone overdoses once and they're dead and I overdose 20 times and I'm still alive and it's not fair. It is not Mm. fair. It's not right. You know, so I have to do something for that. And that's this right now, right here. And, and just, find, you know, if, if you're struggling, you know, to have with an obsession, you have to find somebody to be honest with. And there's this, you know, am I allowed to talk about the program? You can talk on about this anything program? you want, Peter. Okay. So these 12 step programs like AA, they, they give you steps to be able to, to learn how to be honest, you know, right. and, um, it, it's a process. It's not easy. There's three t- forms of, uh, honesty, you know, there's self-honesty, there's cash register honesty and, you know, and there's, uh, there's, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, in the first paragraph of how it works in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, it says honesty three times. That's all you need hmm. to read is if you're going to read anything, yeah, read that. that. You know, and and I know it by heart. And here it is. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. There are those two who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. And then, um, I, I don't know if I skipped a little bit of it, but, but it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. And it, and it was a hundred people who wrote that book, you know, it wasn't one person, you know, they all voted on each letter in the book. So it took a hundred recovering alcoholics to, to write it. So that's a power greater than yourself right there. You don't have to mm-hmm. believe in anything, but, but why not have a hundred people that have the same problem as you that have recovered from it, right? that have written something, you know, why not use a hundred people's brains instead of your own brain to try (laughs) to figure this out, you know? Right. And, and, and that's a a power greater than yourself, you know, Mm. but honesty is the magic, the whole mojo, the whole thing about it is honesty. And so, um, unless to do so will injure them or others, I'm going to be honest completely honest on this podcast, but if it's going to hurt somebody else or myself, you know, I'll take the fifth. Right. You know, that's powerful stuff. When did you yeah. realize that you first needed help? Like, did you have an aha moment? Obviously all those overdoses you would think, but yeah, the first I, no, five no. Didn't I do thought it, then... I, that's a great question because I was um, homeless my wife had a restraining order on me. I was not allowed to, you know, the band was like, Pete, you know, don't give me any money. Don't do anything. And I was on the streets of Venice begging for quarters. And I was like smiling. I'm a rock star in porno for pirates. Like I was, I didn't, 
that, you know, and I was seeing worms all over my face. So my face was bleeding everywhere. I was picking holes. Like I, I got psychosis from not sleeping for five days, smoking crack and, you know, just being, yeah. I was a homeless person begging for quarters. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, I went into my eighth rehab and then this kid that was, he, he was 17 from Texas and he was in the rehab too. And he was like, I love your song, Blood Rag. You know, he had an accent. And he goes, mm -hmm. my parents hate you. And I was like, oh, okay. And then he was sitting with me having breakfast and he left me a note and he got up and I opened the note, thank God. And he said, I'm going to kill myself in your bed. Oh my and gosh. And so I got up and ran and the nurses ran after me because, you know, you're in a rehab. You don't just get up and start running. I go, no, no, no. And I went in there and he was ready to open his veins in my bed, oh, no. you know, porno for paros. He was, it was the song blood, right? Like he, yeah. it was, he was getting called by the devil to do this, this, oh, God. this thing. I didn't believe in God, but I believed in demons and the devil. And now I believe in God and I don't believe in the devil or demons, you know, it's really weird. But <laughs> anyway, but then I was like, no, the demons. So, um, they grabbed him and he was screaming like an animal, you know, and they put him in a straight jacket and took him away. And then I was like, I'm, I was freaking out. Like I said, God, please take me. Let me have an honorable death. I'm dying. Just give me an honorable death. Let me jump in front of a bus and save a baby or something. Just, I don't want to die like this but on small cold beer and, and fluffy white powders and, you know, mm -hmm. and black tar. I want to die. Let me have an honorable death, please. You know, I was hyperventilating and freaking out. Yeah. No, no more fucking drugs. No more. Yeah. Stop. You know, and right then they said, okay. And I was laying on my stomach and I jerked out of my body and I could see the, my back. Wow. And there was this sound like a, like a, a Harley Davidson low end, like rumble. And I was floating above my back. And then I fell back into my body. Then I jerked back out and I was seeing my back. Then I was in space, like black space. And I saw a shutter opening and closing like a camera shutter, like old cameras where the shutters would open and close. Yeah. And, and there was a light and I saw, um, uh, like polywogs around me, like, like orbs, mm -hmm. like, like a, a light ball with a tail on it. And they were all around me. And one was Perry and I was going, Perry, my singer, look, there's, yeah. and he couldn't see the, the, the shutter opening. And I went into it. And I could see 360 all the way around and it all hit me at once. Marry the woman that had your children, go to AA, a hundred alcohol. Jesus came through a hundred alcoholics. They wrote the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and, and, uh, and you, you know, and, and that's the answer. And then I wow. came out of, out of the, the thing and I was trying to get the other polywogs to go in and they couldn't see it. And then I went above my body again and then back in it then above it and then back in. And then I got up and freaked out. Like what the hell is happening to me? Yeah. And so I started walking around and I saw ghosts everywhere. And they were, they were spirits that had died that didn't get to use their bodies to get sober. And so they were, they were spirit, they were burning in hell, not, not literally burning, but burning with desire. They were spirits and they're mm -hmm. trying to get into us to get us to leave to go use all of us and there's ghosts wow. everywhere and i was seeing them and i was telling the people and they were telling me you got to stop talking they're going to lock you up and not just keep quiet people this has happened it's called a white light experience just keep quiet about it do the work and that's what the doctor told me you know just be quiet and then that was it there was no more fighting i was addicted to two to Two packs of Marble Reds a day. I was on every psych med. I was on, you know, every Ambien. I was on methadone, heroin, everything. It just all got lifted. There was no kick wow. anymore. There was nothing. And that was it. And then I got out and got a sponsor and did this thing. And, you know, I'm not any, a saint at all. I'm, I'm still a sinner. And, you know, I'm still just as screwed up. But I, I'm honest. And I had an out-of-body white light experience. So, there was no fight. There was no biting the bullet. Do this thing. It's hard. It, it was a gift, a white light experience. Wow. That's and so really then, awesome. yeah. So then I did AA in the steps and all that stuff. And, and uh, I continue to do meetings every single day. I do at least three on the phone. Nice. Um, and, 
it's my oxygen. It's how I yeah. not kill myself, you know? Yeah. The, the, it's an incredible program. It's such a lifeline for so yeah. many people. And I think it yeah. really provides the, um, the connection that's required, yeah. you know? So was that your, your last rehab experience or were Yeah, that was it. I haven't wow. used, I haven't used, uh, any alcohol or drugs since then. And I just, and it's been, you know, uh, there's been a lot of things, you know, I've, I've, my father died. I've, I've, I've had money. I've had no money. Then back that money again, I've gone through bullies. I've gone through, you know, breaking the law and doing things crazy in sobriety. I've done, you know, I, uh, I live a, a cutting edge, modern family kind of a way that people judge. And, and, you know, so I, it's not like I'm, uh, I'm, you know, better than the neighbor. I'm probably a little, you know, mis more mischievous than the average person, but I'm not <laughs> a coward. I'm not yeah. a coward. You know, I tell people the truth and, and, and if it's going to put somebody else in jail or myself in jail, I'll keep my mouth quiet. You know, yeah. I, I like what you said about, about honesty and then also about not being a coward. Cause one thing that I know whenever I meet someone who's in recovery, I don't have to know anything else about them except that they have a shit ton of courage because of what I've seen that it takes to come through that. And I, so for me, that gives me an instant respect for someone because I know oh. what they've had to fight and what they've had to go through. And, um, and I think it's amazing. And I hope one of the things that we do through this podcast is help to normalize and, and, and break down the stigma of addiction because, you know, it makes it easier to be honest when you don't have to feel ashamed about something, you know? And I think that that, that if people are ashamed and aren't willing to be honest with themselves and others, that keeps them um, controlled by their substance or their addiction or whatever. So I, I just, I love the fact that, that you had that courage to go after it. And that really speaks volumes to who you are. Oh, well, well thank you. I just, uh, I guess I was sick and tired of, I couldn't handle the lies anymore. I couldn't keep mm. up with, oh, I'm going to go to band practice and then band practice. Oh, my wife's making me go do this or my, you know what I mean? And well, she wasn't my wife at the time. At the time I was thinking I was going to have a baby with every different nationality girl. Wow. Um, that's quite a goal, like, Peter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to have a half Chinese baby. I have, you know, African, okay. I'm going to have a, a Middle Eastern baby. I'm going to have babies everywhere, you know, with every race. <laughs> Right. Very multicultural of you. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Now, just um, I, I'm just jotting down some quick notes here, Peter. So okay. I just need to circle back for a second. Um, the fear about the when you mentioned about the penis not being big enough. Now, was there something <laughs> that fixed that, or how did you get over that one again? I'm just oh, asking for friends. Are you asking? Um, I, just jotting no, down no, some. I quick. would. I no, would, I'm just. Kidding. There was no. There was reputation. This guy named Brett B. Rad. They called him B. Rad. Brad. Because all the girls in Santa Monica said he's got the biggest day. He was gorgeous. He surfed the biggest waves. Oh, right? one of those guys. He stick that thing in his ear and go as a gas pump like, for Halloween. Yeah, he looked like Thor. He looks like Thor. You know what I mean? Right. Gorgeous, really tall, huge muscles. And they all said he's rad. And all the girls wanted him. I mean, he surfed the biggest waves in Pit Porto. We were all scared. I would drink. And I'd get the hottest girls at the party. And I'd go, get contest, Brad. You and I right now. Come on. <laughs> You know, and, and I'd be on coke, so it would be shrunk in and sucked in, you know. <laughs> and and I'd go, let's do it. You know, it's like a drunk driver who thinks he's a race car driver yeah. and plows into, you know what I mean? It's a good I, was a, I was a drunk dick contest <laughs> fighter, you know what I mean? And and then and I went, Pink, and he went, boom, you know, and we just, it was over. So, oh you know, God. same kind of thing with fighting. You think you can take someone on and you get beat up, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> well, fuck you, Brad, wherever you are out there. And Peter's so famous, and he's really good at the guitar, and who cares who big, how big your dick is? Oh, it's bullshit. I feel like you definitely got the last laugh, Peter. <laughs> no, it's all beautiful. I mean, you know, I'm happy with what with where things are and, and what it is and everything, but, you Well, know. it seems like you've come a long way from the dick contest days. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, will, I, I will tell you, that's, that's pretty bold, man. That is a, <laughs> that's a, that is a bold, that's a bold move. I, uh, yeah. I get little respect there. Yeah. So funny oh stuff. My gosh. So how did, 
um, your drug use impact your musical career? Because I know there's so many people that well, I, are. Oh yeah, okay. I'll be honest. You know, I you know, I I listen to Leonard Skinner and I go, wow, it's not how good you are; it's how much you drink. Mm. You know, and I would just drink. You know, ah, oh, yeah, it's the you know, and this and that and Slash and Harry. You know, before I met him, wow, so heavy and you know, and so I just dove into the whole lifestyle and and um, you know the the music the music is you know what it is because of how i was living you know sa sure. same with the your brother's music you know right and so right. it it is what it is and then we change you know and so for me to try to get edge you know um in the same way as a you know a 55 year old gray-haired man it's ridiculous you know it's like mm -hmm. it, it was cute when you're in your early twenties, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. you know, and there, it's like, we were race car drivers, like, like Scott Weiland and I used to say, you know, we're like race car drivers, you know, so it, we got into this business to be bad, to be dangerous, you know, and mm -hmm. sometimes we crash, you know, yeah. and sometimes we don't survive the crashes and sometimes, you know, and, and it's just all part of what we did, you know, and to those that, that, uh, that went out in in the in the in the party and and didn't survive. Our hats are up. It's like war heroes. They're war heroes, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I was supposed to die, you know. And and because I didn't, I have to do something different, you know. And, yeah. and that different thing is is for people who it's the music's done. It, you've done it, but you now it's just a a, a meandering misery, you know. Mm -hmm and and a blotted out existence till and then you're lucky if you die early you know and then if yeah. you don't you just you just have an, a, a horrible dishonest fear riddled um existence and um uh unwelcome hanger on mm. to family members and employers that yet you're better off gone for them but they but because of their hearts, they keep you around or, you know, it's, that's no way to live, you know? Right. And so it all worked for us, you know, it worked for your brother, it worked for me, it worked for Perry, it worked for Keith Richards. It worked, and then pretty soon, the, if you go before the music's bad, that's, you know, it's, it's attractive. It's like the 27 club, you know, with okay. Hendrix and Jim Morrison right. and everything. The, you never got to make shitty music, but I see people, you know, a lot of my colleagues that, they kept doing the thing and then the music turned on them and then they became uh, uh, a character mm -hmm. of what they were. Like, it's like a cover band, a bad, pathetic cover band of something that, sure. that it's them, but it's not, it's not, it's gone. The mojo's gone. It went to some other kids, some straight edge kids now, you know, right. or it went to some, you know, some video game players like Ninja or something, you know, who yeah. lips right. at, at, at beating, you know, uh, Mario Kart or whatever, you know, whatever it is. I'm sorry, I'm 55. It's probably. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, so you're going to get some so, heat. You're going to get some yeah, heat yeah, for that one. No, no, okay. but what I did, my kids, you know, that's what they do. They go, they, you know, like I was into Jim Morrison, The Doors, and, and Jimmy Page, and Led Zeppelin, and Hendrix, and they were gods to me. And my kids, the god, their gods are these guys who can play. Um, you know, uh, these video games really yeah. good and, and get high scores and stuff like that. So I made an effort to, I played the, uh, 2018 video game awards and nice. it live streamed for almost 30 million people. And, and the biggest night on wow. American Idol is like 11 million. So this wow. was three times bigger wow. with no ads. Like it was all. And they're doing it all on their Twitches and, and their uh -huh. phones and their game things. And, and so my, my kids were the first time, like, for the first time, were proud of me musically, you know. Oh, In 2018, man. they thought I did something cool by playing with the orchestra. <laughs> and it was, it was called Smash, you know. There was, there was three songs I did, but Smash Brothers was, won the award that year uh -huh. for the, the biggest game, Smash Brothers. Wow. And yeah. so I did the Smash Brothers theme with the guitar and, and I was this, you know, old geezer with, with white hair. And then I had these young girl guitar players and violinists and everybody wow. was young and I was the geezer. And, and it, but, but it was like, that's what you do. You, you go and yeah. do those things sober instead of, you know, 
receiving yeah, but like a slam pit, you know. If the, if they knew you were out there doing dick contests with B Rad, <laughs> they would be looking at you in a whole different light. They wouldn't have thought that way at all. So um, it's funny that you remembered his nickname, B Rad. <laughs> Oh, Peter, so I, I gotta, I gotta ask you, and yeah. um, I, I'm pretty sure I read this. And if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. But is it true that in the same year that you kicked your drug recovery, you also battled and won against cancer as well? Yeah, I had uh, testicular cancer, so I had my left testicle taken out. It still wow. works. So I got, I'm the uniballer now. <laughs> you know the, the so awesome. you know what you yeah. know what you run into, you run into B Rad now and you get into that contest your dick's gonna look bigger just on the simple fact that there's only one ball there so yeah, exactly. I'm just I'm just throwing that out there yeah. clever strategy no and then they asked me during the operation do you want me to us to put a fake one in and I go no I mean you know it'll it'll be like you know a motorcycle instead of a, a car it'll be you know, <laughs> streamlined you know. <laughs> And so, um, <laughs> so anyway, I mean, I just laugh about life because I should have been dead. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, I yeah. have no, I don't care. You know, I don't dye my hair or my beard or do Botox. I just don't, you know, I don't want, I don't bleach my teeth. I don't want to be 35. I'm 55 and I've right. been through the fucking ringer. So I want people to see it. You know, I don't want people to look, oh, I haven't had any hard time. You know, I had a fucking hard time, man. You know, eight yeah. drug rehabs. 20 overdoses all over the world. That's Horrible. Crazy. Yeah. You know? It's and so I just... Um, people we lose. Yeah. So really, there's nothing about me that I can say, yeah, I'm just lucky God had a thing. I should have died. It's not fair that, that I kept getting found for those fam, you know, for, for you to lose your brother like that is horrible, yeah. you know? And so I don't think drugs are cool anymore. I don't think, you know... I'm not for them or against them. Do your thing. I can't do it. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have the talent to be able to, to do drugs and alcohol. And so I don't judge people. Um, I'm just out. I'm out. I tapped out, you know? Yeah. And uh, thanks to a, a, an out-of-body white light experience and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and a sponsor and meetings. Yeah. And being honest in it all, you know? Yeah. Well, losing no. musicians at the, especially at the height of their career, whether it's Brad or Kurt Cobain or, you know, anybody, um, it's so hard because not only do we lose someone super talented, but we're losing a, a brother or a son or a father or, you know, like all these other things. And I think sometimes it's easy to lose track of that, lose sight of that fact that there's so many other sides to somebody, you know? And, yeah. and I think we sort of tend to overlook that sometimes. And really, when it comes right down to it, they are somebody's brother or wife or sister or husband or whatever. And and it's those those losses, I think, that, that everybody can relate to because it could be somebody next door. It could be um, somebody that you work with. It could be anybody. And I think that's what we're starting to see now is that addiction, you know, it's no respecter of persons. And... And it seems like just about everybody has been impacted these days by addiction, whether personally or through someone that they know and love. And it's a, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a, it's such a devastating, it's such a heavy yeah. thing, you know, and, and, and I love laughing with you guys and everything, but, but you know, it, it, it's a, it's a really heavy thing. And I don't, you know, um, it, you know, I, I read the words of Jesus, you know, I'm not good enough to call myself a, a Christian, but I like, you know, that we celebrate Christmas and do Easter. And I like his, his stories and the words and stuff like that. And, and it helps me when resentment is the number one offender. It says it in the book of Alcoholics mm. Anonymous. Yeah. Resentment destroys more alcoholics than anything. And so, um, you know, when Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for them, it, it, it really helps for me to say prayers to something I don't know is even there, but I just do it. And, and I wish my enemies, everything I would ever want for myself, even though it's not sincere, it's, it's totally <laughs> fake, but this radio station this Holy spirit respects you for trying mm. to pretend for faking it. So I fake wishing my enemies or bullies or, or whoever, or, people that I resent or jealous of or, or, or 
hurt me or stole from me or whatever until eventually it's just lifted. And then yeah. you no longer resentment is like drinking poison and wishing the other person to die, you know? Exactly. And then pretty soon the pain's so great. You got to drink to get out of it or right. take a pill or do some drugs. And so I, I, I can't afford to have resentment. And so I try to really just forgive because I want to be forgiven. And also right. I know that, that, uh, you know, when people go, you beat cancer, I didn't beat cancer. It isn't something you beat. It's, I just, okay, I got to show up. I do uh, chemotherapy. Okay, you're pumping me with mustard gas. Okay, all my hair fell out. Okay, so mm -hmm. I got to wear hats when I play gigs now. And when it, this, you know, I just went through it. And same with, okay, another rehab. Okay, another, okay, do this, do that. You know, wear an apron with your butt sticking out and go to the nursing station begging for meds because mm -hmm. yeah. you're kicking. You know, I, I just went through all this stuff. And um, I really feel like, um, like, there's no like beating drug addiction or beating cancer. It's a gift. Yeah. It's a gift from a higher power that we're going to keep you on the planet a little, little longer because you have work to do. Right. And if you don't do that work that, or your, your work is done and we need to leave, have you leave early. So there's no images of you, you know, aging or, or you know, like, mm -hmm. Like uh, you see, you know, um, certain actresses where they were just amazingly, you know, vibrant and everything. And then as they grow old, like that's all the pictures you can find of them is old. And there's only a few of them when they were young. So maybe, you know, I'm not saying this is it, but maybe it's a blessing for the legacy of the art to, to have left early, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. so I just don't understand why so many of my friends left early and I didn't where Scott Weiland used to tease about, like he would tell Oasis, you know, they would jump up on the bed. We were all together. You know, I was playing in Scott Weiland's band for a second called the Action Girls. And we were playing with Oasis somewhere. And, uh, and uh, uh, Scott Weiland said to one of the guys, I think the, the singer guy, Noel, or the other one, uh, Liam, he yeah, said, yeah. you know, he goes, he was bragging about how much Coke he does. I've had I do more coke than Brian Jones or Keith Richard. You know, he was just bragging mm -hmm. about it. And then Scott Weiland goes, Peter does more coke. Peter spills more coke than you've ever done. You know, oh, like, he, like he was like, you know, oh, like gosh. I'm the king. Uh, and then Perry would just look at me and go, you're going to die. Hey, you, you're on a mission to die. I go, yeah, I'm going to fucking just charge. Ah, you know, and <clears throat> I would spend all my money on crack. And, you know, it was nuts. Helicopters, yeah. hookers. Uh, the alcohol, you know, it was, I was, I was trying to die, you know, mm. and God had a different plan for me or the Holy spirit or whatever. And so I was supposed to do this nerdy video game, uh, you know, awards thing with an mm. orchestra, you know, mm. that, that's not really, well, I'm just being silly, but that was an ego thing for my kid, for me to give to my kids, you know, but really what it is, is this right here, right now. This is the most important thing. When you ask me to do this, it's like being presented an Academy Award. There's, there's no stage big enough. There's no album sales big enough. There's no children beautiful enough that this world can give me then to do this podcast. This is the most important thing I've ever done, you know? And every AA meeting is the most important thing I've ever done because that's the reason I'm alive is right. to let people know the obsession can be lifted. And it, the, why fight? Why try to do it yourself? Surrender right. to a God. Give yourself to God. Everything that is you, give to, and then he'll do it. Yeah. She'll do it. It'll do it, whatever the energy is. Right. You know? And you can pick it. You, it doesn't have to be something that the Christians made or, the, or that, you know, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, it could be your own, you know, surfism, whatever, you know, going <laughs> to the ocean and, and wherever it is. It's just, yeah. it's honesty, 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 honesty. In real estate, it's location, location, location. In sobriety, it's honesty, honesty, honesty. And you don't have to do it publicly. You don't have to, that's why I call it anonymous. Right. You can go and hide because a lot of people, if they're honest, they'll get fired right. or their wife will leave them or they'll, you know, or they'll go to jail. Yeah. You know, because they broke laws. And so 
you got you find a sponsor or a priest or someone you can just be honest with, you know. But I'm Absolutely. letting it all hang on this this uh, <laughs> podcast about me because I'm only talking about me. I'm not talking about right. other people that did right. things that I could, you know, throw them under the bus. I'll throw myself under the bus all day long. Well, you know, I'm, I'm ready to face my maker. I'm glad you didn't quit after the seventh rehab stint. I hear from so many people that, oh, you know, I've tried, I've been in rehab five times and it doesn't work. And it's like, no, try again. Just keep trying. Like there's no magic number. Some people it works the first time. Some people it works the 20th time. It, it doesn't matter what that number is. It's just keep trying, keep pursuing that, keep going back because addiction is a thief and it'll, it'll rob you of everything you have and you've got to take back that power in your life. And uh, you're really so right. And do that. Yeah, and what's so important, so tell me if I'm talking too much. I'm sorry. I'm just inspired. Um, <laughs> That's kind of the I, point I, of the I, podcast. Okay, good. okay, good, good. <laughs> because um, I can just shut up and just answer one word questions, you know. <laughs> but okay, so um, this is really, really important. So when, when uh, uh, you know, when, when you are, uh, when the obsession comes, okay, it's 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 uh it's stronger than you the, the, there's 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 you then there's the disease and then there's one who has all power okay so there's three forces okay and so when people don't understand doctors can't even understand i mean when you go when you get arrested you go to jail they they don't send you to like they send you to AA. They give you a court card to get 20 signatures because there's nothing that works better than this. Right. And what is this program? We hold hands and pray. You know, we just, you know, we talk about God constantly. So, so, but what, what people don't realize is that this disease is cunning, baffling, and powerful. This mm -hmm. Satan is cunning, baffling, and powerful. This drug, whatever you want to call it, you know, we call it disease in the professional world of, of drug, you know, it's a disease. Okay. So dis ease, you're at, right. you're not at ease, you know? And so it is cunning, baffling power. It's more powerful than you can handle. So you don't have a choice. So when I was saying, you know, you, I saw all these ghosts, you're possessed by something, you know, that is stronger than you, but there's one who has all power, the one who created everything. You know, the universe is gigantic, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's something that created this whole thing that sends out the Holy Spirit, like a, a transmitter. It's, it's a power, you know, and you can tap into that power. And it's like sympathy for the devil, the song, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like Keith Richards and Mick Jagger lived this long because of that song. Like they, you, it's your brother. It's your, it's your, it, it, God made it too. God makes the sun come up and down on weeds and, plants you know so it, it it you just i constantly say thank you but no thank you mm -hmm. thank you i treat it with respect the disease sure. you know when i see lemon flavored vodka I go, wow they didn't make lemon flavored vodka when i was using it. i go thank you for sharing but no thanks to my disease you know yeah. i respect it it's cunning baffling and powerful it's stronger than me but it's and it's a bully but I love it. It's my, it's, it belongs, it's me, you know? So I, it, it's part of it. It's this thing. And so I respect it. I laugh at it. I have fun with it, but I'm loyal to the one who has all power and it protects me and I can still utilize and work with and hang out and do fun things with the disease, the darkness, the black, whatever you want to call it. But there's, you know, if you worship it and go to it and love it, you're done. You know, and that's, that's basically what we are. Alcoholics, drug addicts are very passionate people. We love, we overlove things, you know, yeah. I love this girl. I love this drug, you know, where <laughs> normal people go, yeah. So how was the soccer yeah. game? And they have a, you know, a sip of the drink and <laughs> right. Ooh, that's, that's, Take a it nice, leave it. that's a nice, yeah, that's a nice, <laughs> I like the bite. It's got a nice bite. Yeah. Well, I'm getting a little tipsy. I think that's enough for me, you know? <laughs> Well, we take the bottle and go, unch, 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 we love it. We love it. You know, it's like, it's like psychotic yeah. addiction. It's, it's love. We're in love. And we just, we, you know, we fall in love with a girl and she, she's like, ah, you know, nor, you know, normal people, uh, you know, I'm, I feel very disrespected and I think I need to get an attorney and we're going to, <laughs> you know, civilized people, you know, we're, 
addicts go, you whore, why did you, you know, we go crazy, you know? And so I just think they're very passionate people. And, um, and so I'm proud to be a alcoholic drug addict. I think we're rad, you know, mm. we're crazy artists. We're passionate people. We're like the most passionate people in the world, but we need help to, 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 to put that passion in things that are not felony chemicals. You right. know? Channel it in a positive direction. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. people are like, I love Big Macs. I lend their 400 pounds, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's, that's horrible too. And then they right. have heart disease. And, you know, addiction's everywhere. But, right. but there's a reason heroin and cocaine and speed is a felony. And you can go into a, a you know, a, a supermarket with a baseball bat and smash four thousand nine hundred dollars worth of stuff and it's a misdemeanor anything over five grand is a felony but right. as long as you don't swing at somebody you know but if you're walking down the street with heroin in your blood it's a felony you know mm -hmm. because the united states of america has figured out this chemical is so strong it takes normal people and turns them into love freaks they fall in love with it you know yeah. well, i like and how you so, put that it's sort of like finding the the good side of a bad thing, you know, like someone can be stubborn, but that also means that they're determined, you know, like it's just yeah. how you look at it yeah, in a negative yeah. light or a positive yeah. light. Yeah. So, I and mean, I, I feel like, yeah, yeah exactly. And I'm going like to let you talk now because I'm too inspired. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I like hearing you talk. I just was saying that I, I get that. Like I, I think what I'm drawn to from people in recovery is the fact that they are so passionate about something and they are, the, the people that I've met that are successful in their recovery are the ones who are passionate about it, who um, are passionate about their program and they're passionate about their sobriety. And, and it's just taking all of that, that passion that was directed at the drug use and, and moving it into something positive that, that allows you to live a better life. Do you share these things with your kids? How do you, how do you talk to your kids about, about They drugs? see me every single morning doing the Lord's Prayer, the Serenity Prayer, reading Chapter 5 non-stop you know on the phone and uh it's just i don't have to say anything they just yeah. they, they, i live it you know and because if i don't i'm going to be smashing their toys the police are going to be coming you know i'm going to be stealing things to try to get heroin you know it's going to be a disaster yeah. you yeah. know yeah there's no in between no not for me <laughs> are we not supposed to be smashing the kids toys because <laughs> no, I don't sometimes so. i I, all right, I was, I, that was for a friend, too. <laughs> okay. Jarrett has three boys that are super active and super wonderful. <laughs> I would imagine some toy smashing could happen in that household. But I just have to show them what I'm capable of sometimes. <laughs> right? I'm guessing. You see, you see this Etch-A-Sketch? Just keep in mind. Let's get our homework done. <laughs> Peter, obviously, obviously, um, you know, recovery is something that's you're very passionate about, and um, you know, coming up on 24 years, there's no way that you couldn't be uh, to be as successful as you have been after that. But something that you've also been, you know, kind of successful in is is playing a little bit of music every once in a while. Take a second here because you told us about a lot of the dark stuff. Take a second, be a little bit braggadocious. And what would you say is your pinnacle, your top musical achievement? Because, I mean, you've had a number one hit. You've done movies in Hollywood. What was, what was that pinnacle moment for you in your musical career? I would say the Video Game Awards was great for my kids. The Woodstock was great because I got to play between Bob Dylan and the Almond Brothers in 1994. That was wow. a pinnacle thing. Um, it was fun touring for five years straight with Rage Against the Machine opening up for us. And they would always end with bullet in the head. And then mm -hmm. I'd have to come on after that, you know, with the crowd just jumping up like crazy. And, mm -hmm. and I'd have to do some kind of music thing. But I think, and then all the movies got, you know, it's really weird because I start over every day. It's a Groundhog Day. I mm -hmm. pretend that my past, I don't go, you know, in 1990, you know, I don't do that. I, I just, you know, like I'm. Tomorrow, I'm going to go and play. This guy came up with um, this idea where for Earth Day, and he came up with the whole video, all the music in it. It's, you know, spliced up the way he wants to do it. I'm not going to judge it at all. 
he wants me to come and play guitar over it. He prepaid me and then he's going to pay me after. And, and it's a rum company, an alcohol mm -hmm. company, you know. Mm -hmm. So I pimp myself to alcohol companies. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, you know, I have no, I don't judge anybody or anything. And so I, I feel like every day is, is um, a, a pinnacle. But in terms of like for, for ego, financially, um, you know, uh, and, and there's different pinnacles. Like this was my best financial gig. This was my biggest crowd. This was my biggest live stream. This was my biggest movie. This was my, you know, uh, and then this was my worst gig. I take pride. The best gig ever was when I first got sober. And I played a place called 14 Below, and only three people showed up. Mm. And I booked it as Peter and Stefano. People knew right then who Porno for Pyros was. It was a big mm. band. We were, we were headlining festivals and everything. Yeah. And then I just, I said, you can't use Porno for Pyros, just Peter and Stefano. And three people showed up, and they were like, can you stop playing now? And I was playing horrible acoustic music, singing out of key and, mm. and really nervous and sober. And I think that was my best gig because. I was in so much raw pain mm -hmm. and incomprehensible demoralization of only drawing three people after playing, you know, every Lollapalooza Woodstock being in the biggest band right after, you know, and to, to, to have to start over and then start playing restaurants. And then finally I started to say, Peter Stefano of Porno for Prowse and then more people would come, you know, but mm -hmm. I, I feel like, like when I got completely smacked down sober. And then I remember playing a Christmas party and I was strumming by a tree and the people who filmed uh, our pets, the number one hit video, yeah. the people who directed and filmed it were at mm -hmm. the party and they were looking at me like, Oh my God, look what happened to him. Mm -hmm. He's just a, a, a little, a, you know, a, the guitar boy in the by the tree nobody's paying attention to him and he's he's just sitting there smiling and playing i didn't even realize that 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 they were looking at me like that i was just wow. so grateful to not be loaded and not yeah. have the obsession and then i was able to make a hundred bucks because all my money was gone you know mm -hmm. so that to me is is the best gigs the, the ones that are the most lowly because you know who i'm playing for then god wow. Oh, that's you know, nice. and then the big gigs and trust me, Perry wants to do porno for piles again. I'll be up in the big crowd again. You know, that's just ego and humans, you know, mm. but when I play for God and I'm alone or I'm finger picking some classical thing that I can't do in front of people because my hands shake, but alone, God gives me the power to do these beautiful things. And that's my best gig because as long as I know that God's going to keep me on the planet. But as soon as I put vanity fame money first i'm dead i should overdose or i should be shot or I should die of cancer you know it's over wow. you know i don't know sorry if that's really heavy but that is no it was a great it's, answer <laughs> you know, yeah. I, just, I think that the, the the worst gigs are the best gigs because everyone just goes oh poor peter you know what <laughs> i mean that if the poor peter gigs are the best mm. gigs because god's like don't worry i'll reward you you know? Well, yeah, and you said uh, you said that Perry wants to get uh, Porno for Pyros going again, and I've I've read yeah, a yeah, bit I, about I don't that. know if I said that, but we're gonna we're gonna do it. It's on this well, podcast. Yeah, you know so. what? It's it's kind of been out there, and I saw that you guys uh, you guys were kind of throwing Mike Watt in the mix for a little bit. Yeah, there. yeah, oh, yeah. We did. We actually played Low Loser Twenty Twenty, and uh, we did it in a backyard with no mic. Like it was just. I wasn't plugged in. I had a nylon string guitar and we did four songs, but they only um, live casted two of them on the Lollapalooza. And they, his management called me, I think it was yesterday and we talked and they said, you know, of all the shows more than Paul McCartney, more than Metallica, the, you know, the bands that played Lollapalooza 2020, you had Horn for Prowse had the most views and we made the cover of Rolling Stone. So wow. people were really interested and they keep listening to it because we weren't plugged in. There was no lights. There was no, mm. it, it, it was just the mics that were in the backyard and it was nice. windy and stuff. And I had no effects, no. And we just ripped, you know? And so, wow. um, and so they would, you know, they said, would you be open to, uh, to, you know, working again and, and uh, doing some shows in August and we're going to, you know, write, record a couple songs and release them. I said, yeah, yeah. Just let me know when, you know? 
So that's awesome. 25 years later, we're going to do that. You know, love that. Can yeah. we expect to see more of Mike Watt with you guys? Yeah. Mike Watt's going to be, I mean, you know, I'm open. To any, I would, my dream would be to have like Dave and me and every, you know, everybody who was all of the whole, you know, the chili pet, all of us, let's all make one big band. But, you know, when it comes to Porno for Prowess, Perry's the band leader. When it comes to, I have a band called Lance Herbstrong, where it's two mm-hmm. DJs and me on guitar. One of the DJs is the band leader. And then one is the producer. And then I just play guitar and make out with chicks. You know, there's, there's, everybody has their job, you know? And so, um, same thing Which, as we know, is always just, your goal in music. Yeah, I just want to play guitar and make out with chicks. And, and I co-write, too. And, and, uh, but oh, yeah, and, and, and I write the music, but whatever. For that, but well, yeah. I co-write with, you know, Perry and the, and the guys. But, but you know, so, uh, so it just makes it simple, you know. So whatever Perry wants to do, I'm down. You know, I'm just, when I show up, I'm going to definitely, you know, be honest. It'll be like, I'll be like I am in my AA in, with the guitar. You know, I'll just be honest. Mm-hmm. And that's what people yeah. respond to. I think they'll feel it. It'll yeah. be the truth, you know? Absolutely. So let me ask you this question, and it's kind of a cliche question, but when you get a musician of your caliber on and, and the influences that you have, on the guitar, give me your Mount Rushmore of guitar players. Um, this girl named Anna Vidovac. Um, She's from Cro- Croatia. And... Um, and another one, another girl named, um, oh my God, what's her name? Her face is beautiful. Um, For, forget about the girls you want to make okay. out with. No, no, no. no, no. no I, just... love, I love classical guitar players. They're, they're, they're oh, geniuses. Yeah. Their right hand finger picking is insane. Mm. So Anna Vidovac, just Anna Vidovac. And then in terms of, of jazz guitar players, it would be like Alan Holdsworth and... Uh, um, and then, of course, Eddie Van Halen for technique, what he did, like, with speed was insane. And then Jimmy Page for all around, most mm-hmm. versatile guitarist and composer. Um, and then, uh, you know, a cliche, you know, like, uh, you know, Jeff Becking, Mae Malstein, uh, you know, Eric Clapton, uh, Randy Rhodes, um, so many, and Al Miola. Um, Peter Frampton, uh, you know, George Harrison, um, yeah, Brad, no. your brother. I loved your brother's playing. Um, Kurt Cobain, uh, Jack White. Um, so, so many. You like a good, yeah, you like a good mix, a good mix of guitar players. You like a little bit of everything in, in some oh, of Oh, yeah, styles, but most but important you... thing is Mojo. You know, the, the guitar players from Leonard Skinner were insane, mm. you know? you know give me back my bull is just you know badass riffs you know with yeah. badass dudes you know um that you know that really appealed to me you know tony iomi doing the black sabbath riffs were just so heavy you know and you know tom Morello's exciting and uh there's so many you know uh i love slash's solos you know sweet mm-hmm. child of mine when, you know, when he goes into the solo there's she, he's heavy you know and uh so i like it all i like you know um yeah and then and robert the johnson a huge i have a big tattoo of robert johnson on my back he's an old blues guy which is oh i'm very sing. familiar yeah yeah so his guitar playing's very i'm very influenced by it and then jerry garcia is my god you know loved jerry hmm. you know so i'm sort of like you know he didn't die. Like we got to see his seasons change. Like I believe that there's um, life expectancy is like 78.5. I think it's 78.7.5 after COVID, but you know, let's round it up to 80 years. Okay. So there's four seasons. So from zero to 20 is your spring from 20 to 40 is your summer from 40 to 60 is your fall and 60 up is your winter wonderland. So I like all the seasons. So I wanted to show my leaves changing, meaning, going from salt and pepper beard, you know, so, and the hair just mm. turning white. Like I wanted to show those seasons and so many of my heroes, like Ringo Starr's got a black beard, you know, they didn't mm. show us their seasons. We, right. we, they stayed in the summer the whole life, you yeah. know, Jeff Beck's got black hair. So I, you know, I, and then the ones that finally let go, they're already in the winter. Like we, 
we never got to see fall. And there's two guys that I got to see fall in this business, and that's uh, George Clooney, Salt and Pepper, and Jerry mm -hmm. Garcia. You know, I got to see him change, the leaves change. It was beautiful, you know? So I just copying those two cats, you know? And, and then you got, you got guys like Keith Richards that have been in the winter since 1966. <laughs> so it's, I guess yeah, we got to be the means of, we got to leave this world for Keith Richards. Like, you know, like, <laughs> we got to go electric for Keith Richards. We got to leave a better world for him. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's so weird to me that Michael Jackson, where I, I mean, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, you know, went yeah. before Keith Richards. Like he, you know, he was supposed to go in the 60s, right. you know, Amazing. blood transfusions. And it, I wanted to be him. I couldn't, you know, I was, I was Whitney Houston. I was, you know, person that was overdosing in bathtubs, you know, but I just kept getting found. She wasn't found. Wow. Yeah. I, well, you were found for a reason. And, uh, and I, I think you touched on that a little bit and now yeah. you're here getting to, getting to work on some new projects and getting to play the video game awards and your kids getting a chance to see you and, and get a little burn with them. So, yeah. um, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's all cool stuff. And you know, that's, huh. you're here to go through your season. So we're, we're happy that you made it. And, uh, and we get to see oh. what this, what this late fall, early winter Peter's going to bring. Yeah, Absolutely. well, well, and let and please, if there's anything I can do for, for you know, the Bradley House, you know, just let Thank me you. know. Um, I, you know, uh, you know, it's so funny. I I have to share this because, you know, I my ego, you know, ego gets a hold of you, and I'm like, hey, you know, um, I uh, was sponsoring Chester from Lincoln Park, and then you know he oh, killed himself, and then yeah. I was hanging out with uh, Chris Cornell and he killed himself. So yeah. I, you know, these, the black and white, like AA or you're out, you know, the, the, sometimes um, people are maybe not stage four alcoholics. They're stage three alcoholic, but they have a problem with something else. And, and if they just yeah. get rid of that, something else that they can maybe control and enjoy their drinking or so, you know, so it's better to try to control and enjoy something than to commit suicide hands down yes, so absolutely. what i did was after um chris and uh chester killed themselves i went that's it i'm gonna get i'm gonna become a certified recovery coach because bob timmons was uh was one before they made it like a certification thing and he was my last he was my eskimo he's the one who took me into my last rehab and mm -hmm. i looked at him in his, his eyes and his face and god bless him he's not here but that was it. That was the last time I used. And so he was like my Eskimo. So anyway, I go, I'm going to try to figure out this thing. So I went to an addictions academy and I, and I, I, uh, I got certified, you know, and I learned about all different ways, you know, and then I came up, you know, and, uh, Dr. Callie Estes made six, um, models of treatment and I added two of them. And I made eight models. And then she asked me if she could use that in her program. I said, please do, you know. And then I was a certified recovery coach. And, and in my packet, you know, you can get paid this much money and you can do this. And so then I went to Hawaii and started helping someone. And I was getting paid, right? And, uh, and I was staying in the nicest hotels, flying first class. I was thinking about buying a condo and everything. And I got, excuse my language, fucking spanked. Okay, mm -hmm. because you cannot serve both God and money. Right. You'll be loyal to one or the other, you know, and right. despise the other. And so I, you know, there's some stuff I've been through in sobriety, you know. I was in a mental, I was locked up in a mental ward at 10 years sober. So it hasn't been an easy ride, you know, yeah. but I'm yeah. sober still, you know. And so um, I, uh, I, uh, I got fired. The guy was sneaking behind me and doing you know what I mean and the family found out and Peter's a fraud I was I felt like a a fake guru you know like like I, I was just so hurt and but what I was hurt about was no Hawaii no no in that you know mm -hmm. and th the hustle was I'm playing restaurants and getting paid for that because it was supposed to be secret but it wasn't see you know I was I was out there to help somebody you know but I was getting paid for it and it was and I told him, I go, you can't pay me for this. Let's pay me for the music, but we'll do, you know, but really, and, and, and to make a long story short, I, I, everything I do is for free. You know, I, I you, it has to be for free and for fun to help people. 
because, or else I'm going to die. I'm going to relapse. I'm going to die. I'm going to, you know, or I'm just going to be in a mental ward sober, you know? So I've done a lot of things, you know, I've thought about Ponzi schemes and did, you know, just like I'm an evil person, you know, and then um, I end up doing the right thing because pain straightens me out. It's so painful to be bad that I'm forced to fly straight, you know? So I'm a certified recovery coach and I made eight models of treatment and I talk to people every day and there was a blackout. There's a, you know, someone that I work with and been working with for a couple of years, every single day, she calls me, we do the serenity prayer. I read a portion of chapter five, how it works in the big book. We both share. And then we end with the Lord's prayer and we do it every single day. And she controls and enjoys her drinking like a lady, you know, she was a blackout drunk, but she was molested constantly by her brother growing up. And she was just drinking to get over that. So then we prayed for him for 14 days straight and the obsession was lifted. And now she can control and drink because she, she, she wouldn't do a, she wouldn't see my way of life. And so I have these models of treatment that I do for people that are, that won't do what I do, which is AA and, and abstinence in the 12 steps, but are on the verge of committing suicide. So at least I can help to keep them alive and they can meander you know, than than to just kill themselves, you know? And so I, I, it's controversial, you know, I don't recommend it. I can't do it. I'm, you know, I can only do one model and that's abstinence and an AA program period, you know, but I'm certified to help people in all these other ways. And I made two, two of them. And so, um, you know, I don't search for people, people reach out to me who can't do AA and I say, try this, but if it doesn't work, there's my way. Uh -uh, you know? Yeah. And it's just, it's better than taking a bullet to your head because a shotgun to your head or a bullet or hanging yourself or cutting, you know, it's just, you know, it's some a, people It's work. hopelessness. And I think yeah, it's, it's, having it's, a program or something gives you hope, gives you a sense yeah. that you will eventually get free from whatever it is that you're struggling with. And I, that's what I think is so powerful about a program is just giving someone hope that there is a tomorrow because if you feel like there's no tomorrow then what's the point of living amen and just so you know if there's anybody who won't see you know the AA way or whatever i'm willing to you know for free i, I don't need money or anything I'll, I'll, I'll see if i can keep them from killing themselves you know i'm all and for whatever so, gets yeah so I, you know yeah that's there's what no i one feel way. yeah so i feel like um you know, and the thing about it is everyone feels like they don't want to be saints. They were having so much fun being naughty and bad. I'm still naughty and bad. I'm still <laughs> just as bad. I'm just, you know, I'm a, a, a married womanizer. I'm just honest about it. You know, I'm very, oh I'm, you know, I'm, uh, uh, you know, everyone knows what I am, you know, and You're I'm honest. a sinner, you know? Uh, yeah. And, and I'm not a coward and yeah. people can leave me, do whatever. I want to go where I belong. I don't want to be, you know. Um, somewhere I don't belong on a lie. You know, I want to, yeah. you know, I, my well, kids you know what I do. Excuse honesty me? is, you said honesty is a big thing and, uh, yeah. and it looks like you're living it still. So, I mean, for a first stage for alcoholic like me, it is. Yeah. You don't have to be honest with everybody, but I'm being honest in this interview with you guys. Cause it's about the Bradley house. It's about absolutely this, this horrible disease that kills people. And if it doesn't kill them, they kill themselves literally with hanging right. and guns and, you know, right. jumping well, off I think buildings. It's, I think right. it's amazing that you're, that you're willing to help and you want to help and you realize that you've, uh, you've been through the, you've been through the landmine. You can help people walk through it and avoid some okay, of those. But, but let's those be honest. Paths. Let's be honest. I tried to make a living and buy a condo in Hawaii and surf. That's with that okay. you're human you know you're what i mean human. i was i was a monster i was like one of those guys that r runs the, the football field of prayers and jesus will help you and i got you know 500 million like i was uh, i was worse than that guy you know whoever he is and well i don't I, know so, i don't know if that makes you a monster I but no but so. at least i'm being honest yeah. that i was and then i and then god spanked me i got well, right-sized if you know, if we're being honest and we're talking about these kind of things here, I can tell you that in 1993, I was uh, 10 years old and I literally, I mean, I can specifically right now go back to the moment of me laying in my bed 
with my little New York Giants comforter and sheets on laying there and thinking to myself, well, this is going to happen. The aliens are going to come here and I am going to be the pet of a fucking alien. And it was like, <laughs> yeah, I like, and I, I mean, it, it literally was like a thing for like a couple of years for me where I was just like, this is, I saw it on MTV. Those guys talked about it. It's, this is happening and the aliens are going to come take over and I'm going to end up living in a dog cage like we do to our dog. And it, so if nothing oh, else, the, the song made me treat our dog a whole lot better <laughs> in hopes that when the aliens came, I would get that same type of treatment. So if, that's that's the impact that you had on me. And what I would have never guessed all these years later, I'd be sitting here talking to you and having this conversation. But like, I specifically was like, fuck, the aliens are coming and, uh, and it's going down. So. Hilarious. Just thought you should know that since we're that's, since we're putting it, since we're putting it all out there. Yeah, you've had yeah, an impact, no, Peter. <laughs> oh wow! Well, you well know, I, that song is it, it, it. That's a deep one, you know. That definitely is a deep one because the the song I just shared about it for the first time, I think, like six months ago. But that song, Pets, that number one song, it was written about a girl I was in love with um, in the seventh grade, and she was. We were both in the seventh grade, and she was in my cooking class, you know. And that was junior high school when we started changing classes and we had cooking class. She was mm -hmm. at my cooking table and I was just, the, the you know, that puppy love thing. And then one day she didn't show up and, and in Santa Monica, it was a horrible thing. And her name was Brianna with a V, like Victor, Brianna Dean. And she, her and her brother were uh, massacred in their house. They came home from oh. school and, and these people raped them and cut them up and everything. And their parents oh. came home. Northside Santa Monica, and we, we it was just, a, it was like a Charles Manson thing. It was a huge tragedy. So I wrote a song called Brianna Dean. And then I was playing it instrumentally, and Perry heard it, you know, many years later. And then when I met Perry, and he was, ooh, pick it up. And he picked it up, and then he wrote the lyrics, you know, over it. But the deep, dark, the song wow. is about Brianna, you know, the music wow. is is about someone I was in love with who was raped and cut up. You know, yes. and cut into pieces when their parents found them. So it's really dark, you know, but, but, uh, so oh. the song I believe was a number one hit because of her. She, her ghost made it, mm. made it go to well, one, you know. I certainly will never know why some people survive their addiction and some don't, but yeah. I do think that the ones who do have, just like all of us who are alive and breathing today, we have a responsibility to live life to the fullest, be the best that we can, and help others. And yes. And that's what I see you doing. So I am very proud of you for that. Well, you're helping me, you know, maybe this podcast, if I didn't ha do it tomorrow morning, I could have drank like we, we, you know what I mean? We just don't, you know, it's one day at a time in the program. Absolutely. It says, that's, I only have today, you know, right. and, and this is the heaviest thing. And then I'll start talking, but, um, we have a daily reprieve contingent on spiritual maintenance. That's in the book. Mm -hmm. That's not my invention. Mm -hmm. I wish I could say invention. Right. But a daily reprieve, a reprieve means a postponement of punishment. Right. So we have a daily postponement of punishment contingent, contingent on how our relationship is with the creator, with the, with the, the higher power, right. he's a higher power, whatever you want to call it, God. So, so it's a daily postponement of punishment and today this podcast gave me a daily postponement of punishment i'm gonna go and have a wonderful dinner with my kids and my wife and and everything's going to be beautiful because of this podcast you know so i i just have to do it every day and yeah. uh, for, you know as long as god keeps me on this planet so if there's anything i can do for the um you know the family foundation the bradley Thank house you. anything that uh you know, you, if you go on my website, peter7.com, you can look at the one of the tabs that says recovery and you can see like my certifications and stuff. And, and if I can help in any way, I'm free, you know? Thank you. And Thank you, uh, if we you want to kill me, just give me money. <laughs> just give me money for it. <laughs> if, if, you, if you don't want to get that guy, let's give him a hundred bucks. You know? <laughs> well, we certainly appreciate you coming on the podcast, and I really hope that we do have an opportunity in the future to do something together because you have oh. a great, great story and great experiences and a great perspective that I think can really help a lot of people. So thank you for your oh. honesty today. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much.
yeah, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing some stories. And uh, hopefully we'll get an opportunity to uh, talk with you soon. Thank you, Jared. Thank you so much, Peter. I really, really appreciate you taking the time with us tonight. You're welcome, Kelly. Wow, Kelly, that was a lot of fun having Peter on. Just uh, an amazing musician who throughout the years has uh, obviously has an incredible story. Um, it was just a, a great chat with him and uh, and to see that he was able to kind of right the ship and, and get everything on the right path. And he's still out there making music and uh, just a really fun chat. Absolutely. Lots of fun. And, and I'm definitely proud of him for for getting his life on track and you know it's not an easy thing to do so ma- massive respect for him for sure absolutely it was uh it was an awesome chat and i hope you guys certainly enjoyed it now again we mention this every week we're here for a reason and that's not just to entertain you guys with uh awesome stories from great musicians and uh all of the incredible things that are going on out there but the noel family foundation is raising funds to build bradley's house to help others people who are in a situation like Peter was, as he told us in the beginning of his career. And uh, there's many ways that you guys can help out the Noel Family Foundation. You can visit the NoelFamilyFoundation.org and pick up any of that amazing merch. All of the proceeds go directly towards having Bradley's house built. You can visit Law-Records.com and pick up a copy of the compilation album, The House That Bradley Built. And if maybe you can share a dollar or two, Kelly, how can somebody donate? They can donate on our website, which is thenoafamilyfoundation.org. They also can donate directly through PayPal at info at thenoafamilyfoundation.org. On Cash App, we're Noel Family. And on Venmo, we're Noel Foundation. Guys, every little dollar helps. Um, if everybody listening right now sent in a dollar or two, we would be that much closer to having Bradley's house up and built. And you can have your little piece of the sublime story by helping get this amazing facility up to start helping people. Now, each week, Kelly, we like to leave our listeners with some with some music, right? We like to talk about music here on this podcast. And uh, I think that we found a very fitting song, obviously having Peter on the podcast today. He is working with a project right now called Lance Herbstrong, and they're doing some amazing songs. Uh, Lance Herbstrong, in case you guys aren't familiar with them, you can go ahead and check them out. It's first name Lance, last name Herbstrong. If you guys aren't familiar with Lance Herbstrong, they can best be described as a motherfucking fun bomb that just goes off inside of you. And this is Legalize It by Lance Herbstrong. Hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you so much for spending some more time with us here in Bradley's house. Unfortunately, it is about that time. You don't have to go home, but it's time to leave Bradley's house. I'm Jared Orr. She's Kelly Noel, and we'll talk to you guys next week.